next on Images Imágenes, the 1993 Latino Year in Review. Saludos. Welcome to Images Imágenes. I'm Miguel Perez. The plebiscite in Puerto Rico, what does it mean for the future of the island and for the Puerto Rican community in New Jersey? The North American Free Trade Agreement with Mexico and Canada, what does it mean for Latinos here and for the friends and relatives we left behind in Latin America? The New Jersey election, what does it say about the potential for Latino political empowerment? Those are just some of the issues we'll be discussing as we review the Hispanic issues of the year 1993 with a panel of Latino journalists. Yvette Mendez from the Star Ledger, Monica Rohr from the Philadelphia Inquirer, and Blanca Nieves, my colleague from the Bergen Record. Welcome to the program. But as, uh, before we begin, let's take a moment to pay tribute to one great talent we lost in the year 1993, Latin jazz pioneer Mario Bausa in this report by Ana Quiñones. Pulsating rhythms resounding through a tearful crowd like a soaring heartbeat discharging the emotions of the inner soul. Latin and jazz musicians emotionally intertwine in a melodic tribute to an inspiring hero. That's the way the memorial service for Mario Bausa will be remembered in Latin music history. I can't even cry anymore because I was in Europe when I got the notice and I called his wife and Graciela, of course, and no one knows the hurt that I have in my heart. All the musicians know that I was very tight with Mario. I love him deeply. On July 11, 1993, Mario Bauza, a legend in the music world, died of cancer at the age of 82. But his legacy and contribution to Latin and jazz will live forever. Jazz has often been considered America's contribution to the arts. Fundamentally, jazz is an African-American music idiom that has produced many outstanding music innovators. Among them was Mario Bauza, seen here wearing a gray hat. This music genius arrived in New York from Cuba during the late 20s. Historically, Cuba was used during the colonial era as a port for the transportation of slaves from the Yoruba and Dahomey tribes. 3,000 of these slaves were sent to New Orleans, the birthplace of jazz. But it wasn't until the arrival of Mario Bauza that a new decade of music fusion between Afro-Cuban rhythms and American jazz would impact on the world of music. It all began in 1931. The famed band leader Chick Webb requested that Mr. Bauza participate in an open audition held at the historic Savoy Ballroom. Mario not only won the audition against 10 other competitors, but he eventually became the band's music director. Along the way, he discovered a young singer named Ella Fitzgerald and begged Chick Webb to hire her. With Mario's encouragement, Ella became a singing sensation. By 1939, Mario had joined the outstanding Cap Calloway Orchestra. He persuaded Cap Calloway to give a young trumpet player a chance. Dizzy Gillespie gave the performance of his life before a live audience. The show's two hours and a half long to play the old show. And so that night I left. And Mario, Mario told him, Mario would sit up and trumpet and he'd say, you did a good job, you did, you know. And so, later on, Cab sent for me for a permanent job. But it's all on the count of Mario Bowser. The late Dizzy Gillespie was also grateful to Mario Bowser for introducing him to the legendary Cuban percussionist Chano Pozo. Together, they revolutionized the sound of jazz with the introduction of the conga drum in a composition called Manteca. This song brought Dizzy international fame. In the 20s and 30s, many Latin orchestras rejected black Latin musicians for fear that they would not be allowed to play in exclusive nightclubs. Mario, 
Part of his heritage became an advocate for racial equality. He believed that music was an international language that came from the heart. In the 1940s, Mario Balsa teamed up with his brother-in-law, the legendary vocalist Frank Grillo Machito, to create one of the greatest Latin music bands in history. Machito and his Afro-Cubans introduced hot Cuban rhythms around the world and initiated what became known as the Palladium Era in the 1950s. Evidence of their lasting impression can be found in exotic locations like Japan. Here is a rare moment in time as the Machito Orchestra is introduced to a Japanese audience in 1960. <laughs> Twenty-nine years later, the first Japanese Latin band, La Orquesta de la Luz, would arrive in the United States and demonstrate the musical roots implanted on the island of Japan. In 1943, Mario Balsa became one of the first Latin band leaders to feature a female lead singer named Graciela. It was also in 1943 that Mario Balsa created Afro-Cuban jazz by blending American jazz and Afro-Cuban rhythms in a song called Tanga. Today, Afro-Cuban jazz or Latin jazz is played on radio stations all over the world. It is also taught at educational institutions like New Jersey's William Patterson College. My approach in jazz was, uh, or my identification with jazz, was up there at the top. And I knew my Cuban music backward from years before then. So I said, it's a way to get a matrimonial out of these two music. Today, Latin jazz is a multi-million dollar industry. At the memorial service, musicians from all over the world came to pay tribute to this great man. Mario Basso's orchestra, playing for the first time without their leader, poured their hearts out in a farewell salute. Tremendous loss in 1993, Mario Bausa. He was a tremendous inspiration to many of us. We also lost in 1993 two other Latino superstars, Hector Lavo and Luis Ramirez. And I would like to begin with that uh, a discussion briefly, if we can, about what kind of an impact they had on your lives uh, as, as Latino women growing up, Latinas growing up. Uh, I'm sure very proud of our musical heritage. What did Hector Lavo and Mario Bausa? Uh, and Louis Ramirez mean to you, uh, Monica or Yvette? Well, being the older one on the panel, <laughs> I think I, I probably am the only one who can remember Hector Lavo um, from the early, early years and going to dance to him at the Corso and uh, just feeling the magic of his music. And, and he, was, it, he was just a skinny little thing, but the, when he opened his voice, uh, the people just danced. It was it was like a dream. It was, and I can't believe that he's gone. And he died so young. They and used to call him the singer of singers uh, singer because of, of singers. such fantastic voice. I met him once. When I met him, he said, "My name is Perez. I want you to know it's not La Voz. It's not mm -hmm. Hector La Voz. La Voz comes from La Voz, the voice." Mm -hmm. And I think people forget that uh, Americans tend to remember, think of Latino singers as Ricky Ricardo uh -huh. and Babalu. Yeah. And they forget that we have such beautiful beautiful uh, singers and such a beautiful heritage and I'm very proud of it. Well, in this country, as far as Latin jazz is concerned, the person who opened the door for Ricky Ricardo uh, was Mario Bausa mm -hmm. and, uh, and his, his brother-in-law Machito, who I also had the great fortune of interviewing and getting to know. They, they are and will always continue to be a, gro a source of great pride for all Latinos and I'm glad that we took at least a few moments uh, to remember them since we're discussing the year 1993 and the year in which they died. Uh, let's get to the issues and let's start with the one that is current still because it just happened in the fall of 1993 and that is the uh, plebiscite in Puerto Rico. 
and Blanca Nieves, you were there covering the election, the referendum or plebiscite uh, for the Bergen record. Uh, you saw it with your own eyes, that emotion that is involved in a, any Puerto Rican election, but this one most of all. At the same time, during the same week, Puerto Ricans were also uh, celebrating the 500th anniversary of the discovery of the island. Mm -hmm. how, just tell me how it felt to be there. Well, it was very exciting. Um, I had never been on the island during an election before, and I had heard stories about um, how the people uh, came out in large numbers, how oftentimes, I noticed the difference how here, sometimes in the States, you don't have the Latinos coming out in force the way they did down there. And it was very interesting to find that 80% um, of the uh, registered voters came out to vote. But it was more than that. It was just the feeling on the island, because it was a close race between Commonwealth and statehood. Everyone felt as though their vote counted. And so you had this bombardment on television. Everything on TV had to do with the plebiscite. The newspapers, radios, everyone was talking about it, from the bakery to the local cafe to the women in the grocery stores. Just everyone was talking about it. And it was very interesting. And. Um, it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. How do you interpret the victory of the Commonwealth status? What does it mean for the future of Puerto Rico? Well, it seems as though uh, the press here seems to think that this is the end of it, but it's not. Um, it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. Uh, starting in January 14th in a subcommittee in the House of Representatives, um, the leaders of the Commonwealth Party, which won on the island, are going to go to Congress to uh, basically ask them to abide by the referendum. Um, basically, all three parties, when they signed the plebiscite law, when the law was put forth, agreed to address the grievances to Congress. It's the first time it had ever been done in the history of Puerto Rico. And basically, uh, all of them uh, agreed that they wanted to be taken out of the territorial clause of the Constitution of the United States, which is where they are presently under. Um, so, starting in January, what they're going to do is basically ask Congress to resolve this issue. They want to be taken out of the territorial clause, so they want to look at other options. Um, they, the Commonwealth Party had offered uh, the populace that if they won, they're going to ask Congress for citizenship, increased federal funding, that they would ask for a guarantee on 936, which was cut in June, and they don't want to see that cut anymore and uh, just uh, agreements on as far as bases are concerned and But they also want, things. my understanding is that the Commonwealth Party also wants a lot more autonomy than they've had in the past. Yes, they do. Basically, um, what political analysts are now saying is that with the results now being taken to Congress, Congress will have to do one of two things. In order to take Puerto Rico out of the territorial clause, they will have to give them, one, an incorporated territory status okay, which would enhance what they have now, or make them a sovereign, free, associated state. Right now they're a free, associated state. A sovereign, free, associated state means that they would never become a state. It would be like a little country, the best of both worlds. It's the closest to independence right, that I've ever heard. Right. It would be the best of both worlds. They would have guaranteed U.S. citizenship. They would have a guarantee on 936, which they do not have now. And they would get uh, federal funding in exchange for the basis that they have there now. Doesn't that sound like they want their cake and they want to eat it? The best of both worlds. That was the campaign. Yeah, I think the U.S. Congress breathed a big sigh of relief when mm -hmm. the vote went towards Commonwealth because I believe uh, Puerto Rico will never become a state. Uh, who, you know, we would have had Puerto Rico would have had more representatives uh, in Congress than a good chunk of the uh, the rest of the country. They're not going to want that. Uh, those people down in D.C., and I think they were very happy with the results. I don't think much is going to happen. I think they're just going to sit back and, and, and just forget the issue. Well, while Blanca, while the, uh, the parties in Puerto Rico compromise themselves to go and lobby in Congress for whatever outcome mm -hmm. uh, the Puerto Rican people chose in the plebiscite, that Correct. doesn't mean that Congress compromise itself That's right. to abide by the will of the Puerto That's Rican right. people. And for 98 years, they've done nothing as far as the status. They've never resolved the status of Puerto Rico at this point. But some political analysts are saying, and this is what they're saying, is that this time it came too close. One of the San Juan papers did a study in Congress after the plebiscite to find out how many of them would have supported statehood 
if the statehood option had won. And they found that out of 135 representatives, only one would have supported statehood. Out of 50 senators, only one would have supported statehood. So Congress did breathe a sigh of relief because they had no intentions of ever giving Puerto Rico statehood. So now that this plebiscite law has come about and they have the results, now Congress can say, okay, this is what we're going to do. They let us off the hook. Exactly. So, so now we're going to take advantage of this. We're going to resolve the status. We're going to give the Commonwealth Party what it is that they want, which would be a sovereign, free, associated state. Mm -hmm. And will there be a cost for independentistas to want uh, Puerto Rico to be independent if, if they have a sovereign Commonwealth state or sovereign state? It, it would be a form of independence. It would be a form it of independence the with the benefit of U.S. citizenship Correct. and the benefit of 936 tax breaks. Correct. I don't think the independence movement will go for that. I, I think they want a complete break 100%. And as one guy told me, or some, one man here from New, uh, New Jersey who believes in independence, he said if statehood had won, it would have reawakened the violent sector of the, the segment of the independence movement. Um, that would have been somewhat interesting to see. <laughs> and violent too. I mean, uh, they, they threatened that it would have become, Puerto Rico would have become another Northern Ireland. Northern Island. Ireland. Uh, so, true. you know, yeah. the, that's a situation. Well, what happens is that if it, if, if it comes about that Congress does resolve the status with Puerto Rico and makes this a sovereign country, uh -huh. all the, the federal government would essentially pull out of Puerto Rico and they would mm -hmm. have to release all the political prisoners that they have in the jails right now. Mm -hmm. In the United States? In the, United, on the mainland? in the United States. They would have to release them. Again, I would, I, let's wait and see what happens in Congress, and probably in 1994 we'll see a lot of that developing. Uh, Blanca mentioned, Yvette, Blanca mentioned that 80% um, of the Puerto Rican people mm -hmm. went out to vote. That's beautiful. And that leads to the next <laughs> issue that we want to talk about, and that is involvement of the Hispanic community in the electoral process in this country. <laughs> Recently there was an election for president of Venezuela. 80% mm -hmm. of the eligible mm -hmm. voters in Venezuela went out to vote. Um, what is that part of the problem that Latinos are not getting involved in the political process here and is that why we didn't do so well in November we are not organized we are we have pockets of organiza uh, of, of, of tight organizations like Hudson County which brought back uh, Rudy Garcia mm -hmm. the assemblyman uh, but for the most part uh, we're scattered all over we're not one group one strong voice uh, but the other problem is that if you listen to the issues brought up by the uh, candidates for governor, did you hear anything about uh, Latinos? They, yeah. were, they were not talking about they Hispanic were not. issues We were totally much. ignored, just as it was a, uh, a, a, it was a race about middle class issues. It was um, similar to the Clinton campaign. Uh, we were not brought up also. <clears throat> uh, so when you don't hear uh, your concerns uh, addressed by uh, uh, Whitman or Florio, who wants to go out and vote? But Monica, I, why is that? Why do, don't they talk about our issues? Is because, well, is it it's, because it's, they take us for granted, maybe? I think maybe? it's a catch-22. I think they don't talk about our issues because we don't turn up out in, in enough force to vote to force them to talk about our issues. So then, and then people don't go out to vote because they don't feel like anything's going to change, so what's the point? I mean, in Philadelphia right now, there's a, a, a huge story breaking in which there is a voter massive voter fraud in a state senate um, race and basically what happened is people were filling out f fraudulent absentee ballots in the latino wards and they were basically going up to people and saying this is a new way to vote mark this x and the latinos who have been so disenfranchised and who haven't gone out to vote thought oh well okay this is a new way to vote i'll just do this and it was kind of like people ta and people taking advantage of that of that that people have not been addressed before and then when finally somebody comes and says well we want your vote it's like this this revelation like wow my vote vote does count what repercussion is that going to have well i think a lot of people now a lot of the voters feel incredibly duped they uh, a lot of them are saying well i'm never going to vote again you know this is what happens when i participate i voted in the past and then you know this is what happens to me i'm used and no one cares about me and nothing's going to change so then the next election rolls around, they're not going to go out to vote. Yvette, mm -hmm. you cover Trenton for the Star-Ledger. And uh, that means that you are very much aware that we only have one Hispanic mm -hmm. state assemblyman, when we should yes. have about eight uh, proportionally yes. and four senators. We have none. Uh, we didn't do too well in the November election. In fact, we lost one mm -hmm. seat. What's That's going right. on? Yeah, as a result of the November elections, uh, the Latino representation was cut in half, like you said, from two to one. 
um, Jose Sosa lost down in Burlington County. Um, he he's a Republican, and he came from a real demo, uh, strong Democratic district. And and the, the last, he came in a, f a couple years ago because of the anti uh, um, Florio's anti tax uh, movement. Um, what happened is it's the same thing. We don't have the economic clout in New Jersey, and, and, and people just don't care. And we're not screaming loud enough. But, but uh, Sosa, for example, is expected to land some kind of appointment in the Women Administration. How optimistic are you that the Women Administration will improve on its record, of, of, on the Florio record of hiring Latinos? She said uh, at, a, at a press conference the day after her uh, win, uh, she said that it would, she didn't make any promises, um, but she said she, it, it would basically reflect the state's population, but uh, she was, it, it would be the, the best man would win. She wasn't going to make any promises. I have, I, I am not that optimistic, quite frankly, uh, about more Latino representatives uh, in the administration. I hope I'm very, very wrong. We had what? Zulima Farber was the only Hispanic uh, cabinet official. Public advocate. Uh, public advocate. Um, that's disgraceful. Mm. Blanca, up in North Jersey in the area we cover for the Bergen record, very few Latinos are getting into public office. Uh, Kay few. Palacios ran for freeholder and lost. We uh, have uh, no county representation. And we have uh, a couple of council people in places like Englewood, and uh, Hackensack, and in Passaic County, there's a little bit more. There are, I think, six in Patterson and two in Passaic, but other than that, very few. Yeah, in the city of Passaic, you have the situation where you had seven Latinos running for the city council, and they all split up the vote, and none of them got elected. Two Latinos uh, ran for the mayor's office. They split the vote, and someone else got elected. If only one Latino had run for mayor, we probably would have had a Latino mayor right now. So in other words, it's political cannibalism. It would have been the ideal situation in the city of Passaic for people to come together and, and turn that city around. Well, I think also um, we have to kind of look at ourselves and at the role the press plays. And I don't think the press does nearly enough to kind of push people into addressing Hispanic issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't, we kind of ignore it. You know, if it doesn't come to a head for some, somehow, we don't push the politicians. We don't bring these issues up, you know, gen just in general, newspapers and TV bring these issues to the forefront. I mean, when you look what happened with the, Rollin, the whole Rollins scandal with, with Whitman, that was, that was front page news. And I have to wonder if newspapers would have played it the same way if it had been about Latinos. Another issue I want to yeah. deal with, I mentioned that in the mm -hmm. introduction, is the North American Free Trade Agreement and, and what that meant to the Hispanic community in this country. Uh, many of us came here because we were looking for jobs. Uh, we got here and now they want to send our jobs, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the textile industry jobs and mm -hmm. the uh, low income jobs back to where we came from. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it put Latinos in a bind, in a catch-22 mm -hmm. situation. Monica, maybe you want to comment on that, uh, what the situation is. I mean, do Latinos support mm -hmm. uh, yeah. NAFTA uh, and have their jobs go away because they're more concerned about the conditions of their friends and relatives back home? Right, yeah, it's, you have, it, it is kind of like... Um, um, you're, you don't know which way to turn because we don't want to lose our jobs here because that's why we came here. That's how we're supporting our families. And, but also we have to look at what's happening in Mexico. By not having like an, a trade agreement, it lends itself to all sorts of exploitation of Mexican workers anyway by the companies that go and set up maquiladoras in Mexico. Right. So maybe with the trade agreement there'll be some kind of we, there'll be some kind of monitoring system now where maybe that'll improve. But nobody knows for that for sure. Or will it just be this whole, like, surge of jobs heading over there and leaving people unemployed here? I mean, it, we only have a couple no more minutes, but I wanna I wanna give you an opportunity to just mention briefly some of the other issues that were in the news that concern Hispanics. Uh, there were many other major uh, pieces of news involving Latinos, and we obviously don't have time to discuss them all thoroughly here. What comes to mind? If if I may bring up uh, Domingo Arroyo. Uh, people may not remember his name. Uh, he is the first American soldier who died in Somalia. He's a Boricua from Elizabeth, and that happened in January. Do people remember him? I don't, I don't think so, and I just wanted to remember him on this program. Mm. 
I think that um, Yvette raises a good point, and that's something I wanted to talk about, is, again, how we cover it, how the press ignores a lot of these issues, and we just let them go by. The defections from the Cuban team in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. 50 athletes defected, and I didn't see it played on the front page of any major newspaper, the New York Times, the mm -hmm. Inquirer, the Washington Post, until like the week after it happened, the Washington Post finally had a front page story. If it was athletes from China, I think it would have been on the front page that's ahead, correct. before then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, the uh, Divina Genao, the, the Divina Genau uh, story, uh, Dominican girl who was raped and murdered, and murdered mm -hmm. in Pasek. Uh, what else? What else comes to mind? Um, the election in New York of uh, Nidia Velasquez, the first Puerto Rican congresswoman uh, to be elected to Congress. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, Luis Gutierrez, he's in Chicago, but he was also uh, elected to Congress this past year. Uh, Pablo Escobar was killed oh, in Colombia, right. uh, mm -hmm. and what that implies to the Colombian community in this country, not mm -hmm. only in Colombia, but in this country, the mm -hmm. image, that, that negative myth that all Colombians may be drug dealers. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe this is the first step to end that discrimination against the Colombian community. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many, many other issues we could discuss uh, here today, and perhaps during the year 1994, we'll get a chance to analyze many of these issues more thoroughly. Uh, we are very happy that you were here, and uh, please, let's keep this panel going, this round table of journalists coming to Images Imágenes, because it's very important to our community uh, for them to see what goes behind, what happens behind those bylines and behind these cameras, and how we deal with, with, we Latinos have this role and this responsibility, not only to the news, but to our own community. And for now, we're, all, we're going only on speculation, because in the elections, in, on NAFTA, on the NAFTA issue, in the plebiscite of Puerto Rico, the results of these Latino issues in, of 1993 are yet to be seen, and that means that we'll have to get together sometime again in 1994 to analyze their true meaning. And I'm Miguel Perez, and I'm here for Images Imágenes, and I hope to see you in another edition next week. Hasta pronto.